I just want to pause in silence and take in the beauty of that beautiful anthem. Thank y'all so much. What wondrous love Christ has blessed us with and what wonderful gifts God has given to each one of us. As I listened to that beautiful music, I thought about the way that Christ's love touches us. Last week, I started a sermon series where I encouraged us to look at the fruits of the Spirit that are born in us. And I said that they all emanate from that first fruit of the Spirit that the Apostle Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 5, love, that wondrous gift of love. And all of these fruits of the Spirit are like seeds that God has planted in our lives. Seeds that by the choices we make every day, we can either nurture and help them to grow so that they become visible to everyone around us. But by the same token, choices that we make in life can also squelch the growth of these seeds that God has planted in us, drown them out so that they are replaced with their opposite. The me that I want to be is someone that people can see these fruits of the Spirit in. We celebrated Don Fowler's life in this sanctuary yesterday. Don Fowler passed away from us in December of last year. And we gathered together yesterday to celebrate his life and his love and his legacy. And as we did, Patricia Parrish, your former senior pastor here, said that in Don's life she could see the fruits of the Spirit. When my time on this earth comes to an end, I hope that people will be able to sit, say about me, we saw in her love, joy, peace, patience, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. For in those qualities, we reflect the life of Christ to this world. Last Sunday, I focused on the first three of those fruits, love, joy, and peace. And today, I want us to look at the next three fruits, the next three virtues that the Apostle Paul lists for us. I hope by the end of this series that we will have a deeper understanding of what these fruits are supposed to look like and that we will be motivated as a collective community to nurture these seeds within us individually and within this community of faith. So I want to begin today as we look at the fruit of patience by asking you a question. If I were to ask your spouse, the significant others in your life, your children, your students, your teachers, your co-workers, if you are a patient person, would you nod your head and let me know that they would say you are a patient person? <laughs> Some of you are going like this instead of like this. So how many... If I asked those people close to you to tell me that you are an impatient person, they would say, yeah, they're impatient. Nod your head. Well, I didn't get a lot of nods. It seems like y'all are kind of indecisive. You don't know if people think you are patient or impatient. Not quite sure about that. Well, my estimation of our world today is that most of us or impatient. Most of us have difficulty being patient in this world for many different reasons. Some of you may recall Margaret Thatcher, known as the Iron Lady. 
In the late 20th century of British politics, she was noted as saying that she was a very patient lady. She says, as long as I get my way in the end. Well, that reminded me of a story that some of you may have heard about a soft-spoken truck driver who was sitting in a restaurant one day, quietly eating his meal, when three bikers came in and they started ribbing him, making fun of him, jabbing at him for all sorts of reasons, and he just sat there quietly and ate his meal in the diner. He paid the waitress for his meal and he exited the diner without saying a word. The truckers, uh, the bikers started laughing with one another and said, well, he wasn't much of a man at all, was he? He didn't stick up for himself at all. And the waitress standing at the door turned to the bikers and said, well, he's not much of a driver either. He just ran over three Harley bikes out there. He had the kind of patience that Margaret Thatcher had, a kind of patience that really just outlived the will of other people. It's the kind of patience that St. Augustine, that fourth century North African bishop, talked about, a patience that he called a false patience of pride, strength of will, to outlast the others with an intent to get your own way. That's not really Christian patience, my friends. That's stoicism. So what is Christian patience? In the Greek, in which the New Testament was originally written, the word that we translate as patience really means to be long-fused to have a long fuse. In other words, it takes a lot to get you frustrated and agitated and irritated in life. But unfortunately, most of us have a short fuse. We get irritated and frustrated and agitated very quickly in this world by things that happen to us. Think about the phrases that you hear when people say they are impatient. I'm impatient when you don't get what I'm trying to say. I get impatient when you inconvenience me. I get impatient when you don't do things the way I want them done. I get impatient when traffic slows me down. I get impatient when I have to stand in line for a long time at the post office or the grocery store. Now, what did you notice? about all of those phrases. It was all about me. All about me. A study was done in the 1970s at North Carolina State University. The study was done to try to find out the root cause of all impatience. And they determined that the root cause of all impatience is narcissism. It's all about me. I become impatient when I only think about what I want, the way I want it, when I want it, how I want it. Thinking of ourselves and worried about what's in it for me more than anything else. A pastor friend of mine tells me that whenever he performs a wedding ceremony, he always makes sure that he reads to the couple that he's about to wed from Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, he says, is the key to a successful and long marriage. For Colossians chapter 3 says, Love one another and be patient, forbearing with one another. My friend says that that's so important because we are used to the phrase, of saying to other people, be patient with me, God isn't finished with me yet. And yet we are so impatient with others. If other people are willing to put up with our quirkiness, 
with those things about us that frustrate them, in love, we should be just as patient with them. I would dare say Colossians 3 is the key to not just marriages, but to all relationships that we forbear with one another because we all rub up against one another and we can easily frustrate each other with our quirkiness and the ways that we do things that are different from the ways other people do things. One of the reasons I believe that we get impatient is because we're thinking of ourselves. Another reason that we get impatient is because we don't like to wait. Now be honest with me. Wouldn't you rather do anything than wait? It's hard to wait for anything in this world. And if truth be known, some people would rather do the wrong thing than to wait long enough to do the right thing. Next year, Jell-O brand will celebrate its 125th anniversary. But the story of the inventor is truly ironic. In 1897, a man by the name of Pearl Waite wore several hats. He was a construction worker, but he also tinkered with patent medicines. He went door to door selling these homemade remedies. In the midst of all of his tinkering, he came up with the idea of mixing some fruit flavoring with some granulated gelatin. And his wife came up with the name Jello. Well, Waite decided this was just another product for him to pedal door to door, but sales didn't go quite like he wanted them to. So he ended up selling the rights to Jell-O to Orator Woodward for $450. Now, Woodward understood the value of marketing. And so within eight years, his $450 investment turned into a $1 million business. Today, not a single relative of Pearl Weight receives one penny from the 1.1 million boxes of Jell-O that are sold every day. Every day. Why? Because weight couldn't wait. Impatient. Impatient. Impatience can cost us a lot in this world. I know for myself that as I reflected on my need to grow more patient, that one of the reasons that I become impatient in this world is because I often try to do more things in the amount of time that I have than I can possibly accomplish. I have a hard time saying no. Somebody asks me to do something, I go, oh sure, I'll do it. And I underestimate the amount of time that it takes to accomplish that task. Some of you are nodding. You must have that same proclivity. Well, my husband will call me here in the church office and he'll say, Are you coming home tonight to eat dinner or are you going to sleep at the church? And I'll say, Oh, no, honey, I just have one more thing to do and then I'll be leaving and I'll be home. And he'll say, well, how long will that take you? And I'll say, oh, about 15 minutes. And he'll say, well, then I'll see you in an hour. And here's the sad thing. He's usually right. I'll be working away on that task. And then I'll look down at my watch and I'll say, oh, my gosh, I told him I'd be home by now. I need to get out of here. And I grab up everything and I get out the door and then I get stuck in traffic. And what do I do? I get impatient with the traffic as if it's their fault that I'm going to be late. It's really about me refocusing on myself, reframing things. And so if you get impatient standing in line at the grocery store and you get frustrated with the people in front of you 
who are taking too long to check out, maybe what you can do is just reframe things a little bit. Like take a look at that Inquirer's magazine that's right there and start praying for the people who are on the front cover because they probably need it, right? Or think about how grateful you are that you have the money in your pocket to pay for those items that you are about to purchase. Reframe where you are so that you can grow in patience. The next virtue that ta Paul talks about is kindness. And I love the story that I read in a Live Now magazine by Sharon and Tom Isler. It's about a time that they went to a doctor's office and they said that they suddenly were ushered into the presence of the Holy Spirit. They walked into this doctor's office and they said it was a beautiful waiting room. It was filled with the latest popular magazines and had comfortable chairs, most of which were filled with patients, ready to see one of three doctors. There was one elderly lady who was sitting off in the corner by herself, and as they sat there in the waiting room, that elderly woman started to sob. She sobbed quietly at first, but then some deep, raw, lonely hurt inside of her just bubbled up, and her tears became loud and massive. As the tears rolled down her face, the people in the waiting room became very uncomfortable for her, embarrassed for her, and they didn't know what to do or say. They tried to look away and ignore it, as if that would limit her embarrassment a little bit. But one little boy jumped up out of his seat and he ran over to the elderly lady, and he tapped her on the knee. The lady looked up at the little boy, and the little boy took his little hands and placed on her cheeks, wiped her tears away, and then patted her hands and said, It be all right. It be all right. It be all right. And when he said those words, a smile broke out on that elderly lady's face and on the face of everyone else in that waiting room that day. That small act of kindness changed her disposition and helped her to see possibilities of hope in that waiting room that day. My friends, it reminds me that in the original Greek, that word kindness really refers to small acts. Small acts. Much like Mother Teresa's famous quote, small acts done with great love can change the world. And they really can. Small acts of kindness can open our eyes to see God's presence in this world and open our spirits to the hope and the possibilities of a better world around us. Small acts of kindness can change us as well. In, 19, or in 2005, a psychology professor at Stanford University conducted a study over a six-week period. He recruited some students to measure their happiness, their level of happiness in life. And then he asked half of the students to go about their life, their everyday life on campus, doing whatever it is that they did with their time. But the other half of the students, he said, I want you to engage in five intentional acts of kindness every week over these next six weeks. When the six weeks were over, he pulled all of the students back together and he measured their level of happiness again. Which group of students do you think measured higher in happiness in that second time? It was the ones 
who engaged in those five intentional acts of kindness every week. When we engage in intentional acts of kindness for others, it also lifts our spirit. What goes out comes back around to us. And maybe that's why Jesus said in the text that we read today from Luke's gospel that we are to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. It does come back to us. Patience and kindness. And then the Apostle Paul says, depending upon the version of translation that you read, he says the next fruit of the Spirit is goodness or generosity. If you read in the NIV, it says goodness. If you read in the NRSV, like Austin did for us today, it says generosity. And I have had people ask me, which one is right, goodness or generosity? They don't sound like they're the same to us. But in the Greek, they are. Because the goodness here is not so much about goodness in a moral sense. It's about doing to others good deeds, doing for others, seeing a need in this world and responding to that need out of the goodness of your heart, using your time, your talent, your treasure, being generous with all of who you are to invest in others to make their lives better, being generous with compliments and encouragement with all that you have to give. About 16 years ago, I read a story in the Washington Post about a clown named Mr. Twister. He received that name because he made those little balloon animals by twisting them. Well, Mr. Twister, when he wasn't wearing his costume, was known as Corey McDonald, and he lived in Santa Cruz, California. He made his living by entertaining at birthdays and office parties, giving clowning lessons and performing on the street. He commuted every day by skateboard. He didn't own a car. He commuted from the mobile home that he lived in with his parents and skated through town to his different engagements. He was arrested and ticketed for plugging parking meters. Do you know what plugging a parking meter is? Plugging a parking meter means that you put coins in a parking meter that doesn't belong to you. A parking meter where somebody else has parked their car and you do it without their permission. And it seems that at the time in Santa Cruz, it was against the law to plug parking meters. If you had an expired parking meter, you would get a ticket for $12. But if you plugged somebody's parking meter, you get a ticket for $13. Well, every time he got a ticket for plugging, he just tossed it aside because he saw that as an anti-Good Samaritan law. Well, when he was arrested for this at the age of 26, he told them he refused to stop plugging parking meters. When asked why he plugged parking meters with strangers, he said, I started plugging parking meters when I saw a friend's car being ticketed. So soon I began plugging parking meters as a random act of generosity and kindness. He estimated that he spends $2,000 a year or 5 to 10% of his income on his generous act of plugging parking meters for strangers. Slapped with that citation and the threat of the arrest, he decided to share his news with a local newspaper. And it didn't take long before the national news picked up on the story, and pretty soon he was being interviewed by CNN and a lot of other national news organizations. Letters started pouring into the Santa Cruz offices on his behalf. And when the city council members met together to talk about this law, they decided to repeal it. And they did so by donning red clown noses 
in squawking them as they unanimously repealed the law in order to show their support and their remorse over this law. And Mr. Twister expressed his appreciation to them by making a clown, twisted balloon animal for each one of them. But he said these words, People ought to be nice and generous toward one another without the threat of legal repercussions. In commenting on that story, one of my colleagues said, all Mr. Twister ever wanted to do was for people to be nice and generous with each other, for people to live out the fruits of the Spirit with one another. My friends, we are called to become people who live out these fruits of the Spirit these fruits of the Spirit, so that others might see Christ at work in us. The late pastor of Paul Balbrook, in his book, Exit Interstate O, writes the following, I remember the unchurched spouse of a woman in a farmer parish. The man never attended church, but she was always there, always quietly working in the background. So other people in the church would talk to her husband and try to encourage him to come to church. One day, he finally did show up at church, and eventually he joined an official membership with the church. So as the pastor, I asked him one day, who was it who said the right thing to you, and what did they say to encourage you to finally come to church? Who was that person, and what did they say? The husband responded, no one. It wasn't anything that anyone said. It really was my wife. The pastor said, but she didn't say anything to you, did she? And he said, no. I guess she just kind of lived me into it. My friends, we can live other people in. We can help people to see Christ by the way we live our lives. May we have the courage and the faith to become more faithful in nurturing these seeds. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.